guys, I'm Kaluna, and welcome back to the next Game of Thrones Breakdown video. In this week's video, I'll be taking a look at the fourth episode of Season 6, The Book of the Stranger. Let's get started. The Wall We open with Jon preparing to leave the Wall, talking with Ed about what it is he plans to do. They argue, with Jon saying he doesn't want to stay at the Wall since his brothers killed him. Understandable. Before they can continue, however, a horn is blown signifying someone arriving at the Wall. And, for the first time since Season 3, we have a Stark family reunion. I am so glad it wasn't another missed Stark encounter. We've had enough of those. I may have teared up a bit at that hug. After getting warmed up, we are treated to a really sweet conversation between Sansa and Jon. We've never seen these two characters interact before, but they've been through so much and know that they need each other. Sansa even apologizes for how she treated Jon when they were younger, which is really cool and shows how much she's matured since season one, when she only referred to him as her half-brother. Sansa wants to take back Winterfell from the Boltons, but Jon tells her he's tired of fighting. It's cool to see Sansa taking the initiative here and really coming into her own. We cut to Davos and Melisandre rehashing what we already know. Melisandre is now Jon Snow's number one fan and believes him to be the prince that was promised. Davos tries to find out exactly what happened to Stannis and Shireen, but Brienne interrupts them before Davos is told, telling them she killed Stannis and walks out proud and not giving a single fuck. Lots of tension at the wall, it seems. Makes sense, though, since we're converging a lot of important characters here. The Veil vale. Finally, we find out what Littlefinger has been up to. Robin Aaron is practicing his archery when Peter arrives with a gift for him. And here we see Littlefinger at his best, turning the accusations thrown at him by Lord Royce back on him. We see just how much influence Peter has on Robin, who seems like he could become another Joffrey if given actual power, what with casually offering to throw Royce out the moon door. And Peter basically holds it over Royce to the point of nearly getting him killed. Now this is the Littlefinger scheming we were missing last season. It's still hard to say at this point if he knew what would happen to Sansa at Winterfell, Showing off Peter's skill at confusing people? Or the showrunners not being consistent with him? Eh, maybe both? According to interviews with Aidan Gillen, it seems like he believes Peter genuinely didn't know Ramsay was a psychopath. But hey, we've been wrong before. Whether on purpose or not, Baelish now has gotten the forces of the Vale to go help Sansa. And boy, is she gonna need it. Maureen. Missande and Grey Worm don't understand why Tyrion invited the people who are funding the Sons of the Harpy to Marine to talk, believing they can't agree on anything. Tyrion says fighting hasn't helped, so he wants to try and put his diplomatic skills to use. Danny is a great conqueror, but still has a lot to learn when it comes to the politics of ruling, as we've seen in previous seasons. Tyrion proposes a compromise. Marine will never have slavery again, but the other cities will have seven years to adjust to the eventual abolishment of slavery. This really upsets Missandei and Grey Worm, who have to play it cool when the former slaves confront Tyrion about the Masters being invited to Marine. Right now, everything is really shaky, and it seems like it won't be long before civil war will happen. I honestly was conflicted about this part. On one hand, Tyrion has a lot of experience with people like this due to his upbringing. But at the same time, Missandei and Grey Worm's attitudes about the Masters not cooperating is just as valid. For now, though, things seem to be alright. But for how long? Vase Dothrak. Jorah and Dario finally arrive at Vase Dothrak, and as they are preparing to sneak into the city, Dario discovers that Jorah has grayscale. They sneak into the city and run into a bit of trouble with a couple Dothraki, who Dario takes out. We cut to Danny making new friends with the Dosh Kaleen, who actually seem like a cool group of gals. Being Dosh Kaleen gives them some form of protection compared to others who aren't so lucky. But overall, we learn that Drogo seems to have been the exception when it came to the cows. Many are cruel and savage. Danny befriends one of the younger Khaleesi, and they're ambushed by Dario and Jorah attempting to rescue her. Danny tells them she has a plan. I really like that they show some humanity amongst the Dosh Khaleen. They are making the best of the lives given to them, and they aren't the problem within the Dothraki culture. Danny intends to change that. King's Landing Marjorie is brought before the High Sparrow, who lectures her about family, wealth, and power all leading to sin. We get a bit of backstory for how the High Sparrow fell into his faith, with Marjorie impressing him by recognizing elements from the Seven-Pointed Star. We get a title drop when she tells him a verse from the Book of the Stranger. The verse talks about walking through a graveyard, realizing everything is for nothing, and setting out on the path of righteousness. Elements from this parable are echoed throughout the episode, but we'll get to that at the end. 
Marjorie seems invested in his story, but as we later learn, it's still her doing just an excellent job of keeping her emotions to herself and using her power of observation to feel out what to do or say. Marjorie is then taken to see Loras, who has not held up as well as she has. She tells him this is more of the High Sparrow's manipulation and for him to be strong, but he just seems done with everything. Looks like Marjorie is running out of time. Back at the Red Keep, Cersei gets a weird look from Forty Old Pycelle before talking to Tommen. Tommen confides in Cersei, though not before telling her that he knows that she doesn't like Marjorie. Oh, mother-in-laws. Cersei goes to Olenna and Kevin and tells them what Tommen told her. Marjorie will be doing a Walk of Atonement soon. All of them agree this cannot happen, because if it does, it will lead to an uprising among the small folk. Jaime proposes having the Tyrell army arrive right before the walk to bring Marjorie back to the Red Keep, since Tommen won't allow his military to attack the High Sparrow out of fear for Marjorie's life. Cersei even convinces Kevin by reminding him of what they've done to Lancel, his own son. Finally, a bit of teamwork for once in King's Landing. How rare. Pike. Theon has arrived at Pike, and he meets up with his sister, who isn't exactly pleased to see him after she tried saving him last time. She asks why he's there, thinking he's there to claim the Salt Throne now that Balin is dead. She mentions how awfully convenient it is for him to show up right before the King's moot. Seems like they're taking elements from the books here. Asha and Victarion, Balin's other brother, mention how suspicious it is that Euron would return to Pike the day after Balin's death, almost as if he knew he would be dead by then. Theon surprises her by saying she should be the one to rule the Iron Islands, and he wants to help her. She certainly didn't see that one coming. And that's it for Pike. It's a real quick scene, unfortunately. Winterfell. Osha is brought before Ramsay, who is cutting an apple with a knife. And the entire time, you know exactly how this scene is going to play out, because Ramsay won't fall for her wiles like Theon did. Add this to the reasons why Ramsay just needs to die in the most excruciating way possible, since he kills Osha by stabbing her in the neck. Ouch! We get it, showrunners! Ramsay bad, no redeeming qualities! Also, nice to see he draws the line at cannibalism. Osha, you were a treasure. The Wall. Again. We get an interesting meal with the main players at the Wall, with everyone's new favorite couple to try and ship, Tormund and Brienne. I gotta admit, it's pretty cute. Ed is even a bit shy near Sansa. Aww. Unfortunately, the good mood is ruined when a letter from Ramsay arrives. Book fans were pleased about this since this is something straight out of the books. The Pink Letter. In it, Ramsay demands that his bride, Arya Stark, who is really Sansa's friend Jane Poole, be brought back to him or Mance Raider, who is still alive in the books, will be killed. There is debate about the legitimacy of the letter. Some speculate that Mance wrote it to force Jon to go and help him at Winterfell. Here, the show is doing a version of that, but just finding and replacing the various pieces. It's Sansa he wants, and Rickon is the hostage he's threatening. Sansa uses this as the final push to get Jon to agree to take back Winterfell with her. Take in charge, you go queen in the north! Vastothrock. Again. Danny is brought forth to the Council of Calls, where all the calls meet to discuss various affairs. Each presents a different outcome for her. Becoming Dosh Kaleen, becoming a Khaleesi to one of the other calls, or selling her to the Wise Masters. Danny says she will do none of these things and calls all of them weak, claiming she will lead the Dothraki instead. They laugh at her and tell her they're going to rape her. But she calmly and coolly knocks over the braziers, setting the temple on fire. Dario and Jorah barricaded the exit so they're all trapped, and all of them perish in the flames except for Danny. She instead emerges from the temple, unburnt. A nice callback to the end of season one. All the Dothraki bow to her and she gives a badass glare to the camera. So, the show is taking a few liberties, mostly the whole being immune to fire thing. In the books, Danny doesn't die the first time because of the blood magic slash dragon awakening. She's actually capable of being burnt as Drogon's fire gives her blisters at the end of Dance with Dragons, though she does seem to have a tolerance for fire. But the show wanted to make a callback to the end of season one when she walked through the flames, so for the show's continuity, it would seem she's immune to fire. And I mean, this end scene is really well shot and so fucking cool. So I think it was a good call. It's also good because it mirrors Jon's resurrection. Danny has once again been reborn in the flames. Now she rises as the leader of the Dothraki. And she didn't even need a dragon this time or anything. So we see a lot of badass women fighting to take back power. Sansa's need to rescue Rickon and restore Winterfell. Cersei trying to unify the small council. Marjorie trying to encourage Loras to fight on. 
Asha trying to claim the Salt Throne, and of course, Danny taking control of the Dothraki. It's really cool to see how well-rounded all these female characters are. As for the title of the episode, Book of the Stranger, besides it being a nod to the High Sparrow story, the meaning that he puts behind the passage permeates throughout the whole episode. The idea that people are cutting through the meaningless bullshit to finally do what they believe is right. John getting over himself and doing what needs to be done to save his home. Cersei realizing that her petty squabbling with the Tyrells only made things worse. Tyrion's acceptance of compromise in order to try and avoid all-out war. And Danny's complete upheaval of the Dothraki culture because she views it to be wrong, and instead wants to place herself as the ruler. It seems then that the time for dawdling is nearly over. There's wars threatening to break out all over, the civil unrest in King's Landing, the inevitable fights to be broken out in Slaver's Bay, and the war for reclaiming the North. Won't be long now before the fights go full force. Preview Looks like Littlefinger makes it to the wall, and Sansa asks what we've all been wondering. Did you know Ramsay was evil? Arya is receiving a bottle of poison from Jack, and it's probably going to be her first kill mission for realsies this time. The King's Mood is finally taking place at Pike, and we gotta wonder who else is going to challenge Asha for kingship. Tyrion and Varys meet another Red Priestess in Marine. Not exactly sure what she wants, but I'm really curious, since we know Varys isn't a fan of magic. And finally, Bran is having another green sight vision, but this time it's of the Others and the Night's King. So, what did you guys think of this week's episode? Do you ship Tormund and Brienne now? Will Tyrion or Grey Worm be correct about the intentions of the Slave Masters? Will the Tyrell army make it in time to save Marjorie and Loras? What will Danny do now as the new ruler of the Dothraki? Did Baelish know the whole time what would happen to Sansa at Winterfell? Will Arya actually complete her first kill mission? Who will wing the King's Moot? And what is Bran seeing? The past, present, or future? And will he be able to stop it? Post your thoughts and comments below. Thanks for joining me in this week's breakdown. I'll see you guys in the next episode. Bye! Geek Vision